Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. The winter of 1935 was uncharacteristically cold in Los Angeles. Temperatures reached as low as 25 degrees, but the brisk weather couldn't slow down the elegant and exclusive Hollywood parties, and 29-year-old actress Thelma Todd seemed to be at every one. Thelma's glamorous white blonde hair and comedic chops had made her a star in 1930s Hollywood, but it also landed her in the middle of multiple scandals, from engagement rumors to affairs to divorce. But she didn't let the gossip get her down. On the chilly evening of December 14, 1935, Thelma curled her blonde tresses and slipped into a blue evening gown with a long fur coat. Then she headed off to Sunset Boulevard for a party hosted by actor Stanley Lupino and his daughter Ida. It was, by all accounts, a wonderful night. But... It was the last time Thelma Todd was ever seen alive. Two days later, Thelma's maid and assistant, Mae Whitehead, walked into the actress's garage and noticed something horrifying. Thelma Todd was slumped behind the wheel of her Lincoln Phaeton, still wearing her blue party dress and fur coat. She was dead. Over the next few weeks, Thelma Todd would wind up in the center of one final scandal, and the mystery of her death would send shockwaves throughout Hollywood. Thelma Alice Todd was born on July 29, 1906, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, to John and Alice Todd. She was a happy, carefree child who could usually be found playing with her older brother, William. The Todds seemed like the perfect family among the Lawrence community until tragedy struck in 1910. That summer, Alice took both William and Thelma to Vermont to visit some family. During the trip, four-year-old Thelma and seven-year-old William took a tour of a local creamery, and they got so excited that the pair decided to explore the place themselves. Thelma and William crept into the factory and marveled over the creamery's gigantic machinery. But suddenly, William's coat got caught on a gear. It yanked the young boy inside the metal jaws of the machine. Thelma ran for help. But by the time they could get William to the hospital, it was too late. The boy was dead by the end of the day. The loss hit the Todd family hard. And although no one could blame Thelma for her brother's death, the young girl took it upon herself to try and cheer her parents up. She became a tomboy, showing more interest in sports and activities usually reserved for young men, whether intentional or not. Thelma tried to fill the void left by William's death. Her grief took this form well into her teenage years, until Thelma found a passion all of her own, film. She started taking trips by herself to the Broadway Theater in downtown Lawrence, where she would sit for hours in the audience, watching one silent film after another. But soon, Thelma would find her way out of the audience and in front of the camera herself. In 1924, a teenage Thelma took part in a vaudeville show. Just a few months later, she received her first film offer. It was a small role in a local production called The Life of St. Genevieve, but it was enough to prove to Thelma that this was how she wanted to spend her life. Unfortunately, her father didn't quite share her enthusiasm. Ma, I've got news. Is Dad home? What is it? I'm in the middle of I've been offered a spot in the vaudeville show full time. They want me to start as soon as possible. That's... that's great to hear, Thelma. Oh, great. I don't think so. No daughter of mine will be working as a vaudeville actress. You tell them you're sorry, but you won't be taking the job. Now, John, if Thelma wants to do it, then we should think about... There's nothing to think about. You can find another job, a practical one. While you're under my roof, it's my rules. Understood? And that was that. 
In the fall of 1924, 18-year-old Thelma Todd set her acting plans aside and headed off to the Lowell Normal School to become a teacher. But she didn't leave her dreams aside for long. In the spring of Thelma's first year of school, Thelma heard that a studio called Famous Players Lasky Corporation, which would soon be known as Paramount Pictures, was opening an acting school in New York City. Thelma? Thelma Todd? Napoleon? Fancy running into you! What are the chances? I was just thinking about you. Did you hear about that new acting program in New York? Oh, well, of course I did. It seems lovely. Now, have you sent in your application yet? You'd be a shoe in I still have a stack of your headshots from the show if you need any extras. <laughs> Stop it. Throw those away. You're sweet, but I'm not acting anymore. You're kidding. You're made for the pictures. <laughs> oh, you're too much. Acting was fun, but I'm focused on my studies now. That part of my life is over. Well, only if you want it to be. Thelma's acquaintance, Napoleon Damara, a local theater manager, took it upon himself to submit Thelma's headshot to the acting school for her. Thelma didn't even know until a few weeks later, when she got some unexpected news, she'd been accepted into the program. All she had to do was drop out of school and move to New York. But Thelma's father still didn't approve of his daughter's acting dreams. It's rumored that on the night she left Massachusetts, her mother helped her sneak out of the house before her dad could find out. Get in the car. We've got to get you to the train station before your father notices I'm not in bed. What if I'm making the wrong choice, Mom? What if he's right? Maybe I should stick to the safe thing and become a teacher like he says. Thelma Alice Todd, you're destined for greatness, and you're going to be a star. Don't listen to anyone who tells you otherwise. But what if- Enough of that! Sometimes you have to stop asking what if and find out. That starts with you getting in this car. Now, are you coming or am I driving to New York alone? And so, on July 20th, 1925, Thelma headed in for her first day at the famous Players Lasky program in New York City. But things didn't come easy to the young actor at first. Thelma struggled to fit in at the program, and her new teachers felt Thelma didn't take her exercises seriously. To make matters worse, a leading actor within the program, Richard Dix, came to her one day with some concerns about her weight. You're never going to have a shot as a leading lady if you can't stay thin. This stung, and Thelma soon forced herself into a strict, unhealthy diet to keep the weight off. But Thelma's luck with the program suddenly changed in November of 1925. She and her classmates were invited to act in a film called Fascinating Youth. It was the biggest movie she had ever been a part of, and she even got to tour around the Northeast to promote it. In the spring of 1926, the cast of Fascinating Youth made a special stop in Lawrence, Massachusetts to screen the film. After years of watching movies in the Broadway theater, Thelma finally sat in the audience and saw herself on the big screen. But the celebration was short-lived because just a few months later, Thelma received some heartbreaking news. Her father had died from a sudden heart attack. Thelma knew that now her mother was alone. She wrestled with the thought that she should put her acting career on hold for her family's sake, but ultimately she decided to stay in New York and keep trying. And finally, her work started to pay off. In early 1927, Thelma was offered her first leading role in a feature film. She would star alongside comedian Ed Wynn in the film Rubber Heels. But that was just the beginning of the good news. Shortly after the release of Rubber Heels, the film studio told Thelma that they wanted her to move out to Hollywood. It seemed like her career was finally taking off. Once again, Thelma had some reservations about leaving her mother, but there was an easy solution to that. Hello? Thelma Todd, it's your mother. Are you packed yet? Mom... I already told you, I'm not sure. California is so far away, and I can't just leave you. 
Who said anything about leaving me? What do you mean? You aren't getting rid of me that easily. I'm coming too. And with that, Thelma Todd packed up her things and headed out west with her mother. But she had no way to predict just how much her life would change in Hollywood. Coming up, we'll look at Thelma's glamorous life in Hollywood and the events that lead up to her mysterious death. On April 17, 1927, 21-year-old Thelma Todd arrived in Hollywood with her mother and a plan to be a star. The pair quickly found an apartment and started to settle in. But once Thelma started working, she realized that her new life wasn't going to be as easy as she hoped. The other actors at the studio were cold and unwelcoming, and Thelma continued to question her career choice. Oh, hi, honey. Wasn't expecting you back from the studio so soon. Did you eat? (laughs) I'm not hungry. Oh, Thelma, what's wrong? Bad day? (laughs) They've all been bad days since we got here, Ma. I'm not cut out for this. Honey, you've got to give it time. You've just got to believe that it's all going to work out, okay? You'll be a star. (laughs) Do you really believe that? I sure do. Soon enough, everyone will know the name Thelma Todd. Now, go wash your face and I'll make some tea. Alice was right. On May 18, 1927, Thelma found out that she had booked a starring role in a Western called Nevada, opposite Gary Cooper. And once her career in Hollywood got rolling, it didn't stop. In early 1928, The studio First National expressed their interest in buying Thelma out of her contract with famous players Lasky. This seemed like a huge opportunity, and Thelma was ecstatic. Until she got a look at the contract. I said hold my calls! Let's get to it, Thelma. Here's the updated contract. Mostly boilerplate stuff. Nothing you didn't see at Lasky. Sure, of course. Let me take a look. Just need your signature on the last page and we'll be good to go. Uh, what's this part here? A weight maintenance clause? What, that boilerplate, I told you. You're what, 122 pounds now? Sure. You just can't lose more than six pounds, or gain more than six. You're a natural beauty, but it's important that our starlets remain, you know, fit. Well, hang on. I'm not sure this feels quite right since... Hate to break it to you, kid. This is industry standard. But if you don't feel like signing, then excuse me. I don't need to waste my time. No, wait. Sorry, of course. Let me see that pen. Thanks to the new contract, Thelma was headed straight towards stardom. And along with her success came a steady stream of parties and suitors. Thelma found herself swept up in a string of short, casual flings. She was romantically linked to a band leader named Abe Lyman, the Russian actor Ivan Lebedev, and even got engaged briefly to an insurance agent named Harvey Priester. Soon, Thelma discovered that her dating life had earned her a new type of fame in the pages of the L.A. gossip magazines. This new attention and focus wasn't exactly welcome, and soon Thelma began wrestling with anxiety. But the more she tried to fight against having her private life splashed across the tabloids, the more she realized it was a losing battle. This was the cost of her newfound fame. By 1929, Thelma was finally coming into her own as a leading lady in Hollywood and cementing her legacy as a comedian. She signed a contract with Hal Roach Studios, joining the ranks that included legendary comedy duo Laurel and Hardy, And in 1931, Thelma even created a comedy duo of her own. That summer, Thelma started acting alongside a comedian named Zasu Pitts on a string of comedy shorts. Hal Roach was so impressed with the pair's on-screen chemistry that the studio decided to make them full-time partners. But as successful as Thelma was in comedies, she deeply wanted to prove herself as a serious actor. 
Thankfully, in July of 1931, she got the opportunity she was looking for when she landed a role in director Roland West's drama, Corsair. Roland was a little worried about Thelma's history as a comedy actor, so he met up with her before shooting to discuss a plan that could help distance Thelma from her less serious persona. Thanks for meeting me, Mr. West. Call me Roland, and it's my pleasure. <laughs> Fine, Roland. I'm just honored you cast me in the film. I promise I won't let you down. Listen, Thelma, I do think we need to do something big to separate you from your comedic side. I think... no. I strongly advise that you change your name. But people are finally starting to get to know Thelma Todd. And you want me to become someone new? A new you for your new career as a serious actor. Well, if you think it would help. Fantastic. Rest in peace, Thelma Todd. Cheers to the new you. Thelma was prepared to do whatever she needed to do to be taken seriously in dramas, and by Roland West. So when she started production on Corsair, she arrived with a new name, Alison Lloyd. It didn't take long before she had a new romance, too. Thelma and Roland hit it off on set and soon began a secret affair, even though she knew Roland was married. Unfortunately, gossip started flying about the couple's illicit relationship, and Thelma found herself in the center of a Hollywood scandal. By the time the filming ended, she had had enough. The relationship fizzled, and Roland went back to his wife. And that wasn't the only thing that didn't last. In November of 1931, Corsair hit theaters and nearly flopped. The film received lukewarm reviews, and no one was talking about the dramatic performance of Alison Lloyd. So Thelma made up her mind. She dropped her alter ego and her dreams of serious acting, and went back to Hal Roach Studios to produce more comedies under her own name. But the fling with Roland must have caused a shift in Thelma because she soon started to think about marriage. She had dated a lot of different men throughout her 20s, but now the movie star was headed towards 30. And when she met a man named Pat DeChico, she decided it was time to get serious. Hi there, I'm Thelma. Todd, of course. I recognized you the minute you walked in. Pat DeChico. And what is it that you do, Pat? Oh, I'm a businessman and an actor, and lately I've been working as a talent agent. Speaking of, I have some ideas about how to get your career back on track, if you're interested. Are you trying to work with me or insult me, Mr. DeChico? Actually, I'm trying to ask you out, but it's not going so well. How about we try this again over dinner? Thelma and Pat quickly fell into a whirlwind relationship, and one day in 1932, the couple decided to elope to Arizona. The marriage was a surprise for everyone. Even the gossip magazines were shocked. But Thelma soon realized that rushing things with Pat might have been a mistake. Pat turned out to be a possessive and controlling husband. He didn't appreciate all the time Thelma spent at work and with all the other men on set. Finally, less than a year into their marriage, Thelma had had enough. In May of 1933, she jumped at the opportunity to get away from Pat and headed to England for a publicity tour and film shoot without him. But her time overseas took a scary turn. Take another deep breath for me, Thelma. I'm fine. I told you. I just fainted. Don't try to get up. I need to listen to your heart. Listen, Doc. It was nothing. I have a big day today and... Not anymore, you don't. You need to go home and rest. It's your heart, and I think it's serious. The news was terrifying, especially since she was so far from home. But she managed to get through the rest of the shoot under the doctor's supervision and headed back to the United States in June of 1933. It's unclear whether it was the health scare or her crumbling marriage with Pat, but Thelma decided not to go straight to Los Angeles. Instead, 
she stopped in Lawrence, Massachusetts to see her old family and friends. She traveled back to California one month later and Pat met her at the airport, but their relationship was far from healed. Just a few months later, Thelma sat down with her lawyer to draw up a new will. In it, she left only one dollar to Pat. Everything else would go to her mother. And as the couple headed into 1934, things between Pat and Thelma continued to crumble. Want to go out tomorrow night? Dinner, maybe? I got work. Then I got a couple appearances to make. What if I won't allow it? I'm your husband. You should do what I say, and I say you're going to give me attention for once. I may be your wife, but I'm not your property. Why don't you act like you know the difference? Don't you dare talk back to me, or I'll... I'll... You what? I'll break the next one over your head. Wash your own dishes from now on. And with that, Thelma stormed out of the house and immediately filed for divorce. She listed the reason as extreme cruelty. The pair reportedly stayed civil after the split, but Thelma Todd did her best to sever ties with Pat. Given Pat's anger problems and what happened to Thelma only a year later, she likely had a good reason to keep her distance. Coming up, we'll dive into the tragic last year of Thelma's life. Now, back to the story. In the spring of 1934, 28-year-old Thelma Todd was free from her rocky marriage and trying to plan for her future in California. She had built a steady career as a comedy star, but Thelma began to set her sights on something outside the frenzy of the film industry. Luckily, an old friend had the perfect proposition for her. Roland West and his wife, Jewel Carmen, owned a home on a hillside property called Casta La Mare, near Malibu. The space was home to an old restaurant, but the business was struggling to recover from the Great Depression. Roland felt that he needed a gimmick to keep the place afloat. Who better to be the face of a restaurant than beloved Hollywood actress Thelma Todd? Thelma agreed. Soon, Roland made plans to open a brand new restaurant at Casta La Mare. They would call it Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe. During the summer of 1934, Thelma split her time filming comedies during the day and working on the cafe in the evening. She started spending nights at an apartment above the cafe to avoid the drive home from Malibu. Roland often stayed in that same apartment after late hours at the cafe. Gossip magazine speculated that Thelma and Roland had rekindled their romance, but the two waved off the rumors. They said they were simply business partners. The cafe opened in the early fall of 1934 and was an instant hit. People came from all over the country to see Thelma in action. She was always working around the cafe, doing one thing or another, greeting customers, waiting tables, and even helping in the kitchen. Thelma started 1935 on a high note. She was ecstatic about her new cafe and still managed to keep acting at Hal Roach Studios. But only one month into the new year, things took a turn for the worse. In February, Hal Roach Studios received a disturbing letter addressed to Thelma Todd. It said... Pay $10,000 to Abe Lyman in New York by March 5th and live. If not, our San Francisco boys will lay you out. It was a strange, threatening message, but it made no sense. Abe Lyman was a man who Thelma briefly dated in 1928. But the fling had ended without a lot of drama, and there were no hard feelings between them as far as Thelma was concerned. She reached out to Abe directly, and the whole thing got even stranger. He swore he had nothing to do with the letter and didn't know who sent it. But over the next few months, more notes started to arrive. They were all in the same threatening tone. Some included a drawing of the Ace of Hearts, which led the media to dub the mysterious letter writer the Ace. And in the summer of 1935, it seemed like the Ace's notes were more than threats. 
One day, Thelma came home to find that her house had been broken into. She got so scared that she decided to flee the city and move into the cafe's apartment permanently. Thelma kept her guard up constantly. Her days of partying around Hollywood were over. Now, she only left the Malibu property to work at Hal Roach, and she headed directly home each night after a shoot. Thelma got so nervous that she even started asking her assistant, May, to check her meals before she ate them, in case they were poisoned. The whole thing seemed overly paranoid, until the day when May found small pieces of glass sprinkled in Thelma's food. Finally, one letter from the Ace arrived that included a return address in New York and the name Richard Harding. The police quickly headed out to check out the lead. In August of 1935, they arrived at the address, but there was no one named Harding there. Instead, the police took the building's landlord, a man named Harry Shemansky, into custody, even though Shemansky had no actual ties to Thelma or the letters. It seemed unlikely that the man was actually responsible for the threats, especially once Shemansky pleaded not guilty. But at this point, Thelma was looking for any kind of relief. She used Shemansky's arrest as a sign that the danger was behind her, and she tried to find a normal life again. But when the letters kept coming, she had no idea what to do. Ultimately, she decided to just ignore them and not tell anyone. Meanwhile, back in New York, a 26-year-old named Edward Schiffert heard about Harry Shemansky's arrest and went to his parents with strange news. Shemansky was innocent, he said, and Edward could prove it. When his parents didn't believe him, Edward went to the media. Long Island Daily Star, reporter Drake Lewis speaking. I saw you covered the Harry Shemansky letters case. He's innocent. Is that right? Any evidence to support that claim, sir? This is Ed... Uh, Richard Harding, the ace. Meet me and I'll give you all the information you need for a story. The pier, three o'clock. Wait, hang on, I... Sally, get me the main line at the FBI. When the reporter met with Edward Schiffert, the FBI were waiting. They arrested the man for extortion. When they found a handwriting expert to compare Edward's handwriting to the letters, the FBI knew they'd finally found their man. It was a perfect match. It turned out that Edward was a fan of Thelma's, who had followed her career for years. That soon evolved into obsession, and finally, threats of violence. Thelma was horrified to discover that this was all the dark side of her fame. But ultimately, she was relieved. It seemed like, finally, she could put the ace behind her. In December of 1935, Thelma went to lunch with her co-star, Zasu Pitts, and Zasu's husband. As far as Zasu could tell, Thelma was the happiest she'd ever been. Thelma bought Christmas presents for everyone in her life, from her co-workers on set to her families and friends. She had big plans for the holiday. Unfortunately, she'd never live to see it. On December 14, 1935, Thelma got dressed in her apartment above the cafe and prepared herself for a big party at the Trocadero nightclub in Hollywood. She invited Roland to come along, but he turned her down. He had too much work to do that night. So Thelma went to the party alone. Thelma seemed to be in good spirits at the party, for the most part at least. An actress, Ida Lupino, said that Thelma ran into her ex-husband, Pat DiCicco, at one point in the evening, with his new girlfriend in tow. Ida claimed that their interaction made Thelma furious. But in any case, Thelma continued to party until about 3 a.m. Then, finally, she gathered up her coat to leave... Her driver, Ernest, opened the car door and Thelma waved one final goodbye to her friends before climbing in. It was the last time any of them would see Thelma Todd alive. Ernest later recalled that Thelma had been quieter than usual on the drive home. When they arrived at the cafe, he prepared to walk her up to her apartment. But that night, Thelma told him not to. So Ernest reluctantly got back into his car and watched her as he drove away. 
Nearly 30 hours later, in the early morning of December 16, 1935, May Whitehead entered Thelma's garage to retrieve her car. But when she walked inside, she was startled to find her employer at the steering wheel. At first, May thought she was asleep. But as she walked closer, May spotted blood around the actress's nose and her skin was cold. She was dead. Her death was soon ruled an accidental suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning, even though the car wasn't running when they discovered her body and there was still gas in the tank. And over the next few months, the evidence would begin to point towards a much more terrifying conclusion. Thelma Todd was possibly murdered. On the morning of December 16, 1935, the body of 29-year-old Hollywood star Thelma Todd was discovered inside the actress's Los Angeles garage. Thelma was slumped over the driver's seat of her Lincoln Phaeton. According to the autopsy, she had been dead for almost 30 hours. Strangely, during the whole time Thelma was missing, no one bothered to look for her. Even her self-proclaimed best friend and business partner, Roland West, didn't notice her absence. Or if he did, he didn't act on it. Roland West, who also occasionally stayed in the apartment over their cafe, claimed that Thelma never made it home from a party the previous evening. He supposedly believed she was with her mother, but he never made an effort to check in. Once Thelma's body was found, Roland was quick to call the whole thing a tragic accident. According to him, she must have died by carbon monoxide poisoning as her car ran inside the closed garage. This seemed like a likely theory, at least until Roland's questionable alibi started to raise some serious suspicions about his intentions. It seemed like Roland knew more than he was willing to say, and authorities began to wonder if Thelma Todd's death was accidental after all. On the morning of Monday, December 16, 1935, Thelma Todd's personal assistant, Mae Whitehead, went to the 29-year-old actress's garage in Malibu, California, to pick up the car. But when Mae opened Thelma's driver's side door, she discovered something horrifying. Thelma was dead. Her corpse was still dressed in the evening gown she had worn to a party two nights earlier, and small traces of dried blood pooled around her nose and mouth. May bolted to Roland West's nearby cafe for help. Hello? Roland, help! May? What's the matter? It's Miss Todd. She's... I I saw her in the garage and she's... She's what, May? Spit it out. Dead, Roland! She's dead! Hang on, I'm right behind you. Roland ran to the garage where Thelma still sat in her car. He noticed the camellia flower Thelma pinned on her dress before the party two nights earlier was wilted. He knelt down and gently wiped the blood from her face. When the police and the coroner arrived a few minutes later, they discovered that rigor mortis had already set in. Thelma Todd had been dead for at least a day. Mr. West, I don't think there's any reason to believe this is anything other than an accident. It's my fault. Is that right? Oh, I mean, well, I locked the door. She must have forgotten her key, come in here for shelter until sunrise, and then, you know. No, no, Roland, don't blame yourself. This was just one of those freak accidents. Just a freak accident. Right. The autopsy seemed to confirm what Roland and the police already believed. Thelma died of carbon monoxide poisoning. There was nothing to point towards foul play. At least, not yet. On December 18, 1935, the coroner began a formal inquest into her death. Thelma's closest friends and family, including May Whitehead and Roland West, 
were called in as witnesses. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until Roland started answering questions. Roland explained that Thelma normally entered the apartment they shared through the side door, but he had accidentally locked it the evening of her death. When asked if he'd heard her knocking on the door that night, Roland said no, but he did have Thelma's dog with him in bed, and according to his testimony, the dog began whining around 3.30 a.m. At first, Roland claimed that he didn't get up to check the door when the dog woke him up, but over the course of the inquest, his story shifted. Have the records show that we've returned from lunch to continue questioning Mr. Roland West. Now, Mr. West, what time was it when you heard the dog whining? Must have been 3, 3.30. Like I said, the dog would always whine when Thelma came home. He loved her. In that case, it would stand to reason that Thelma was at the door. But why didn't you get up to let her in? Oh, I did. I opened the door, didn't see her, and went back to sleep. I was under the impression from your previous testimony that you never answered the door. No, I went to the door when the dog started whining. Mr. West, before we broke for lunch, you clearly stated that you did not check the door. Now it sounds like you're changing your story. Hang on a minute. Am I the one on trial here? Thelma is dead. What does it matter if I open the door or not? Just trying to piece together the facts, sir. The inconsistencies in Roland's statements raised a lot of eyebrows. Things grew more suspicious when the coroner's inquest could not conclusively determine whether Thelma had been murdered or not. There may not have been clear evidence of murder, but not everyone shared Roland's belief that Thelma's death was a simple accident. Unfortunately, we only know the cause of death. The autopsy revealed that Thelma Todd died from carbon monoxide poisoning, but we're still getting to the bottom of how exactly it happened. Well, was it an accident? Suicide? We are not ruling out any possible explanations at this moment. Mr. Johnson, do you have any reason to believe that Thelma Todd was murdered? I can confirm that we're seriously considering the possibility. I suppose this is the time to announce that we'll be continuing the investigation in front of a grand jury. You will all have answers soon. No further questions. Thelma's friends and family were notified that they would spend their holidays testifying in front of a grand jury. The authorities were going to get to the bottom of whether or not Thelma Todd was murdered. Coming up, we'll dive into the grand jury investigation that raised more questions than answers. As news about a grand jury investigation into 29-year-old Thelma Todd's death rang through Los Angeles in December of 1935, her close friends and family planned the woman's funeral. Just days before Thelma was finally laid to rest, her mother, Alice, sat down for an interview with the press. All I know is there's no way Thelma could have committed suicide. She was a happy girl with so much to look forward to. <laughs> She sure seemed like it. Do you have any idea how it could have happened? I know it was an accident. It had to be. She got locked out and went to the garage for warmth. And then, well, made a terrible mistake in turning on the car. I know this is awful to think about. But do you have any reason to believe Thelma was murdered? It's impossible. Everyone loved Thelma. She had no enemies. With all due respect, ma'am, I'm not sure I agree. What about the letters from the Ace? And the burglaries that forced her to move out to Malibu in the first place? In fact, I've been hearing rumors about some gangsters hanging around the cafe. My daughter's death was an accident. Those rumors are simply that. Rumors. You better write that down in your little pad. On December 19th, 1935, Thelma's friends and family came to Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, California, to pay their final respects. Thelma's body was dressed in elegant satin pajamas, and her coffin was surrounded by multiple arrangements of flowers and portraits of the actress. A single envelope with the name Allison written on it lay beside the display. The letter was likely from Roland. 
in reference to the stage name that she used while the pair shot their one and only film together. Roland West was visibly upset at the funeral, Regardless of the suspicions he caused because of his strange behavior at the coroner's inquest, it was clear that Roland was heartbroken. Finally, Thelma's coffin was laid to rest. Her friends and family headed off, hoping to move forward with their lives despite the grief. But unfortunately for Thelma's mother, that wasn't possible. That same day... Alice received a terrifying letter from someone calling themselves the Ace. It was the same name used by the mysterious person who had sent threatening letters to Thelma in the last months of her life. Alice's letter claimed that the author had something to do with Thelma's death. Alice knew that the person who had written Thelma's letters was in custody in New York State. She couldn't believe that this was anything more than a terrible prank but she immediately reported her new letter to the FBI anyway. The federal agents agreed. This was likely not a serious tip and didn't require further investigation. Strangely, FBI records show that agents believe that Thelma received her own threatening letter just two days before her death. It's unclear whether that letter was also sent by someone claiming to be the ace. But the report also says that someone close to Thelma denied the existence of this other letter. The name on the quote was redacted, but it seems likely that it came from Roland West himself. It's unclear whether Roland was trying to cover up a piece of evidence or just putting a stop to another rumor swirling around Thelma's death. In any case, when the grand jury finally convened at the end of December 1935, There was no mention of the ace or the strange, menacing letters. By that point, the investigators had set their sights on another key piece of evidence that had the potential to break the case wide open, if they could get their hands on it. Miss Todd, it has come to our attention that your daughter... (laughs) Oh, my sweet, sweet Thelma. I know this is difficult, and we'll do our best to go as quickly as possible. Do you have any knowledge of a diary of Thelma's? There have been rumors that she kept one, might give us an idea if she was suicidal or if there was someone out to get her. Her death was an accident. But for the record, you do not know about a diary. (laughs) Okay, that'll be all, ma'am. Without any concrete evidence pointing towards foul play, the jury began to lean towards Alice and Roland's version of events. The Thelma was locked out of her apartment and retreated back to the garage, where she accidentally died of carbon monoxide poisoning. But the jury foreman wanted them to be sure before landing on an official verdict. So on January 3rd, 1936, the entire jury headed out to Malibu, so they could tour the area where Thelma died. Roland West met the jurors at his cafe and then took them around the premises. He seemed to be in good spirits at the time and even joked around with some of the men. Nothing seemed to contradict the narrative of Thelma's accidental death. At least, not until some jurors asked to see how far the garage was from the cafe, so they could retrace Thelma's alleged last steps. Okay, uh, just another minute or two, and we'll be there. There are 271 steps in total, but who's counting, right? You're telling me that you think Miss Todd walked up all this in the middle of the night, in heels? I'm wearing my comfiest loafers, and I've barely made it up halfway. I'm sweating through this shirt. Hang on, weren't Thelma's hair and clothing in perfect shape? How'd she manage to keep herself together? Especially after a long night out. I'm stone sober and I think I'm going to pass out. Hmm, yes, she seemed well kept when we, you know, found her. But maybe she cleaned herself up. Well, here we are at the top. Finally. So, where's the garage? Uh, Just a short walk from here. Oh... 
That one visit changed everything the jurors thought they knew about Thelma Todd's last night alive. Once they made it back to court, the jury foreman made an official announcement. The jurors no longer believed that Thelma could have walked herself to the garage in the middle of the night. Roland's theory wasn't holding up. This seemed like a massive turning point in the case. Finally, there was clear reason to believe that there was more to the story of Thelma's death than anyone had thought. But no one was any closer to actually uncovering the truth. The jurors were desperate for a shred of evidence that might paint a clear picture of Thelma's death. But there was nothing to be found. The police investigation was going nowhere. Frustration soon gave way to outright anger. On January 8th, two members of the jury erupted in a heated argument inside the courthouse about the dead-end case. It seemed like the more they looked into it, the more questions they had. But at least one person was done asking questions. Thelma's mother, Alice. Thanks for meeting with me again, Miss Todd. I know our readers are still desperate to get to the bottom of your daughter's death. Well, that's their problem then. There's no part of you that thinks Thelma could have been murdered. By who? She was loved by everyone. Well, the police seem to think it's a possibility, and some members of the jury- There's no evidence, none at all. As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed, and I'd appreciate it if everyone would just let a poor mother grieve in peace. I'm sorry, but We're I- We're done here. Waiter! Finally, Alice Todd got her wish. Due to the lack of new evidence and the increasing frustration of the grand jury members, the investigation quietly closed down for good. And when an out-of-state police officer called in with a potential lead just a few months later, it seemed like the LAPD couldn't care less. LAPD homicide. Hey there, Officer Dolan in Ogden, Utah here. Utah? What are you calling us for? Nothing but bad news is my guess. Well, depends what you consider bad news. We got an anonymous tip that the middle-aged man who supposedly killed Thelma Todd is at a local hotel. We've got surveillance on him, but thought we'd call you first. Let me stop you right there. You've got the wrong guy. Is there a different officer on the case? The main line forwarded me to your phone when I mentioned Thelma Todd. Well, I was assigned to the case, but that case is closed. Thelma Todd killed herself accidentally. Nothing further to look into. Oh, that's strange. Thanks for calling. But even though Thelma Todd's case was officially closed, strange bits of information continued to emerge over the next months and years. Next, we'll dissect the rumors and theories that still linger around the Thelma Todd case after all these years. Now, back to the story. In the spring of 1936, the Los Angeles Police Department quietly closed their investigation into 29-year-old Thelma Todd's death. The two people closest to Thelma her mother Alice and her friend Roland West continued to assert that Thelma's death was an accident. But despite their opinions, this seemed unlikely. For starters, the jury involved in the investigation had already identified the difficulty of walking up 271 steps to the garage from where Thelma's driver dropped her off. Plus, she was wearing heels and the shoes reportedly showed no signs of serious wear. In his testimony, Roland West also said that Thelma was likely unaware of the dangers of carbon monoxide. But at this time in the 1930s, carbon monoxide deaths were becoming more and more frequent. Newspapers and magazines constantly reported on these horrible occurrences. A film was even created with hopes to educate more people on the dangers of carbon monoxide. Thelma was a well-educated actress who paid close attention to news and media. She also claimed to fix small issues on her car herself, 
meaning that she likely understood about exhaust. Both these details pointed towards the fact that Thelma was well aware of carbon monoxide poisoning, regardless of what Roland said. There's also the possibility that Thelma poisoned herself on purpose, well aware of what the carbon monoxide would do. But nothing in Thelma's life seemed to point towards her taking her own life. Just about everyone in her circle acknowledged how happy Thelma was at the time she died. At least one of her old friends, a co-star named Zasu Pitts, reportedly held on to the belief that Thelma was murdered, even after the LAPD closed the case. What's gotten into you, Ma? You look like you haven't slept in days. I'll make some tea. I've just got a real awful feeling about what happened to Thelma. It was an accident. That's what the court says. What else could have happened? I think she was murdered. Roland knows more. I can see it in his face. He had something illegal going on in that upstairs room at the cafe. I just know it. There were always strange guys up there. Gangster-looking guys. Come on. I know you don't like him, but that sounds like... A few days before she died, we went out to lunch. She told me she was worried about something. Money trouble seemed like. But I just let it pass. Why didn't I ask her more about it? Why didn't I listen? <sighs> oh, Ma. She couldn't have done this herself. Someone killed her. I know it. Zasu's alleged theory that Roland was somehow involved with the mob and that the mob killed Thelma could explain Roland's strange, inconsistent testimony. It would also explain why Roland never made an attempt to find Thelma when she disappeared. Many years later, Thelma's personal assistant, May, opened up to her family about what she believed happened to Thelma, and her story shared a lot in common with Zasu's. I want to hear more stories about Miss Todd. She sounded like quite the lady. She was one of the greatest people I worked for. It's such a shame we lost her so soon. I'll never forget that day. It's such a tragedy. A terrible accident. I'm not so sure about that. She was involved with... Never mind, I don't need to go there today. It was so long ago. Oh, come on, Grandma. Involved with what? Well, I guess enough time has gone by. She and Mr. West were tied up with gangsters. Bad people. I think they were running some illegal gambling business. But Thelma wanted nothing to do with it. And after Thelma died, Roland kept throwing these gambling parties at the cafe. Why didn't you say something to the police? I don't understand. Oh, honey, I was just a lowly maid. I was an outsider. I was terrified they'd make me a suspect if I disagreed. So I didn't say anything. Now, try those plates, won't you? In the years after Thelma's death, business boomed at the cafe she once owned with Roland. But in the mid-1940s, the wave of fans wanting to pay their respects to Thelma slowed down. So Roland decided to rebrand the cafe. He named it Shea Roland, after himself. But the new name didn't stop the rumors about Roland and his mob ties. He allegedly continued to host illicit gambling parties in the upstairs dining room above the cafe, the same gatherings that May and Zasu suspected led to Thelma's death. As the years turned to decades, Thelma Todd's life and tragic death eventually faded from public consciousness. But in the 1980s, a Hollywood screenwriter began researching the story for a script he was writing with his wife. We'll refer to him as Jeff Townsend for the sake of his privacy. When Townsend started asking around the LAPD about the old case, he realized that May and Zasu weren't the only ones who suspected Thelma was murdered by the mob. Thanks so much for having me over, Officer Dalton. I know you're a busy guy, so I only have a few questions about Thelma Todd's death, and then I'll let you get back to your day. Son, this is about as busy as it gets now that I'm retired. 
Now, as for Thelma Todd, murder case from the 30s, if I remember correctly. Well, I believe the official cause of death was accidental poisoning. Oh, sure, sure. Well, everyone figured murder. Uh, just no evidence to prove it. Really? Any suspects? Uh, rumor was that her lover had some ties with some L.A. gangsters. It's something about an illegal gambling operation. There was supposedly some meeting with Thelma the night she died. I figured that went south and she wound up dead. Unofficially, of course. You think the mob murdered her? Why didn't the LAPD do something? It was a long time ago, kid. Different world. I can't say for sure, but sometimes back then there were cases you didn't work so hard. I see. So you're saying you think that... I'm saying I think that's all I've got for you. Now, if you don't mind, I've got some work to get back to. The more Townsend dug into the old Thelma Todd case, the more he suspected that Roland West was somehow involved in her death. And just about every officer he spoke to shared the same suspicions. But Jeff Townsend struggled to get his screenplay made, and it was eventually shelled for good. And with that, the story of Thelma Todd was finished. So with all of that said, I think the theory that Thelma was murdered by members of the mob is the most plausible. There are too many holes in the official story. Plus, judging by what Thelma's friends said, it seemed likely that Roland was somehow involved, or at least knew more than he told the police. I see where you're coming from, but there just isn't enough evidence for me to say for sure that Thelma Todd was murdered. I think her death may have just been one terrible tragic accident. Whatever the truth may be, Thelma Todd's death shines a light on the dark side of Hollywood that we still see today. From the sexist contracts she signed to her obsessive and dangerous fans like the Ace, Thelma was just another example of the awful price women sometimes pay for fame.